our guest speaker tonight, Laura Werner, graduated with a Master of Physical Therapy degree from UBC in 2008. She has been practicing as a registered physiotherapist with, with specific training in the management and treatment of pelvic floor, abdominal, urogynological, and lumbopelvic dysfunctions since 2010. Her passion for pelvic health physiotherapy was ignited during her woman's health practicum placement in her master's program. Post-graduation, Laura sought out the training of Marcy Diane, a highly sought leader and teacher in the field of pe pelvic health. After intensive mentoring, Laura was invited to join Marcy's practice, the highly regarded Diane Physiotherapy and Pelvic Floor Clinic where she remained for over five years. During this time, Laura also worked for the renowned multidisciplinary Volvo Denia program at Vancouver General Hospital. When not supporting her clients, Laura spends time with her three wonderful children. Although she has no longer teaches, she is still an avid yoga student and takes any chance she gets to get outdoors. Laura Werner. Everybody. Thanks for having me today. Uh, <laughs> two little shies in the corner. Two of my three. The oldest is uh, I'm firing a baseball game, so I'll have to swing by and get him after. You're out. <laughs> okay, whoops. And we're going, I guess. introduction. Um, yes, I'm a registered physiotherapist, and so when most people think of physiotherapists, what do you think of? Exercises, movement, getting back to activity. You could do the same with the pelvic floor, and most people when they're referred to pelvic floor physiotherapy, whether it's for bladder or bowel control, or for women organ support, or vaginal pain, or for genital pain, they think physiotherapy for our pelvic floor, but yes. So these muscles that we'll talk about, um, which I should say, by the way, I see men all the time. There is not a good male model on the market of the pelvic floor. So I apologize, this one has a vagina, but a lot of the muscles, <laughs> that sounds weird saying that, but uh, a lot of the muscles are the same, so I'll differentiate. But these muscles, the pelvic floor muscles, are under our volitional control, basically meaning we can find them in our bodies and tighten them, just like you can go to your biceps and instruct your brain, instruct the biceps to tighten. You can do the same thing for the pelvic floor, and if these muscles aren't doing their job, there can be trouble, there can be problems, and you can rehabilitate them. But they're one of the most trickiest muscles to tighten and to figure out if you're doing it right, so we'll get into that. Okay. Sound pretty good. Let's see if I can do this. Super. Okay, so learning how to take an active role. The way I like to treat in my physiotherapy practice is to provide what I like to call, or what we call in the rehabilitation world, active rehabilitation. So giving information, education about what's going on with the condition with that person, what normal functioning should look like, and then what rehabilitation includes so that people understand why they're doing it, getting better buy-in, and can end up getting better results. So it's not, it's, which is the opposite of passive physiotherapy, which is something like getting a hot pack, so someone keep doing something to you, or getting a massage, or someone doing what's called sort of soft tissue work. So this is more of an empowering role, me teaching you what to do so that you can help yourself. So at the end of the session, I'm hoping you will understand the pelvic floor in terms of bladder control mechanisms. Um, you probably have an understanding, but we'll talk a bit about external beam radiation, brachytherapy, and how that relates to bladder concerns. We'll talk a bit about prostate surgery and how that relates to continence or can, can um, contribute to incontinence. We'll talk about pelvic floor contractions or Kegels or Kegels, tomato, tomato. And we will touch on pelvic floor exercises and erectile dysfunction. Okay, so typical bladder control. Let me just double check here. I'm going to go back. So this is the big blue circle is supposed to be a bladder. It's hard to see, but at the bottom of this, this is the urethra where the, where the urine comes out. 
and there's a reddish line that's supposed to be the pelvic floor muscles. So when the bladder is empty, it's collapsed down and it's a hollow vessel, and as it fills with urine, it expands in all different directions, and it's supposed to wait until it's got about a cup to a cup and a half in it, when at that volume, the amount of urine stretches the bladder walls, and in response to that stretch, the bladder, which is a muscle, has a gentle spasm. And that's the way that the bladder says to the brain, I've got some urine in me, can we go to the bathroom? And with normal bladder control, if we are not in a place like a toilet where we want to go pee, or we're doing a presentation, or someone's in the bathroom, or we want to keep sleeping, we want to be able to say to the bladder, no, you got to wait for me, uh, or there's someone in the bathroom where I'd rather finish what I'm doing. And what the bladder should do is calm down and wait for you. Also, another function, if your bladder is really full or is full, we should still be able to jump and to cough and to sneeze and do lifting and carrying without there being any leaking. So that's normal bladder control. So with external beam radiation or brachytherapy, it can affect, in the short term, four to eight weeks after the therapy, the bladder, bladder urgency. So symptoms can include burning while urinating or when urinating, frequency, meaning that you're visiting the toilet often and often for smaller volumes, urgency, so the feeling of I gotta go and I gotta go right now, and with or without incontinence. So, and I think there's an uh, animation here. Yeah, so typical bladder signaling is the smaller blue black triangles. But when the bladder is irritated from the radiation or brachytherapy, um, they can have basically like a temper tantrum. And if the bladder temper tantrum is stronger than the closure of the pelvic floor muscles at the bottom, then there can be the incontinence. So treatment looks at, there's definitely medications that look at the bladder um, contractility and can help calm that down. There are some dietary concerns that are, dietary uh, modifications you can make that is typically looking at items that have high acidity and lowering them and most common coffee, tea, chocolate, carbonation, spicy food, citrus, there's a list of things. There are some really neat things that you can do with urge management strategies that include both cognitive and behavioral strategies as well as including the pelvic floor. So one of the roles of the pelvic floor muscles is that when you tighten them in the right scale and amount, it sends a message to the bladder, which is sitting in here, basically saying, shh, it's okay, calm down and can help control the bladder. Um, and so there's a little story that I tell, but it's really, it's really neat, one of those roles that can calm down the bladder. Um, and there's also some cognitive behavioral things as well too. I mean, sometimes, for example, running water or coming home and putting your key in the front door, right? All those different things where it's basically like Pavlov's dogs and being the food, ring the bell, being the food, ring the bell, ding, right? So I had one client who, she said, you know, my, every time I come home, first thing I do is go pee. My dog doesn't even wait for me at the front door anymore. He just goes to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started to teach her these urge management strategies, and she said, my dog's confused. He doesn't know where to find me. <laughs> so there's lots that you can do, and it's really quite amazing how that can be help, helpful. And what's nice about the external beam radiation and brachytherapy, it, it's usually time limited. So after the 48 weeks, it, it goes away. But in the meantime, there's some things that you can do. Okay, so if you have difficulty urinating, and your urologist will tell you this, you want to see your doctor, and if the incontinence persists two to five years after treatment, see a physiotherapist and also visiting your doctor as well. Another spasm in bladder. Okay, so with radical prostatectomy, so this is a side view. I wonder if it does. Okay, so tall. Here is the bladder. And then here's the urethra coming down. <coughs> right here, as you probably all know, is the prostate. So part of the closure mechanism for the bladder include two sphincters, an internal urethral sphincter, which is actually continuous with the prostate and part of the base of the bladder and the bladder neck. So what that means is, unfortunately, when they take out the bladder to take out the prostate cancer, often the internal sphincter is mucked with or taken out. So part of the closure mechanism is compromised. What we do have is still the closure from the external urethral sphincter, which is part of the pelvic floor that we have volitional control over. So we can teach pelvic floor exercises to help maintain closure. And the pelvic floor spans from, this is the pubic bone here, 
the pelvic floor will span across here, they'll have an opening for the urethra. Spans across here, has an opening for the rectum, and then comes back and attaches to the tailbone. So it's like a sling like that. That kind of makes sense? So the most type of incontinence, especially after radical prostatectomy, is what we call stress urinary incontinence. And thank goodness it's, it's physical stress, not emotional stress, because then I think we don't have a hard time. So stress incontinence occurs when there, the increase in intra-abdominal pressure, so those big arrows are pressure coming from within the abdominal cavity, which happens when we sneeze or cough or lift or push or pull or bend over. That puts pressure down on the bladder and if the pelvic floor muscles, which are at the bottom of the urethra, that red thing that you can barely see, if the pressure coming down on the bladder exceeds the closure pressure of the muscles at the bottom, then there can be a leak. So that's what we call stress urinary incontinence. So the pelvic floor, which is the closure mechanism, is what we're addressing with these pelvic floor exercises. There are layers of the pelvic floor with really long names, and it's interesting because some of the anatomists can't even agree on what to call it. So some one of them, one anatomist calls it pubocoxygeus, and then some call it puborectalis, and in women sometimes called pubovaginalis. It really honestly doesn't matter. I'll break it down into two layers. So the deepest layer is like a bowl or a hammock. So this layer they call the vader ani, and as the name suggests, it elevates the anus but the bladder and in women the uterus as well too. So that's the levator ani. In this layer is an important muscle that helps with bladder closure. And I've drawn pen around it. So I've got a female model, so there's three openings, but of course for men there's two openings, minus the middle opening. But it's like a sling, and it starts at the pubic bone, and it loops around all three openings, and slings to the other side. I'm not sure if I'm holding that well, but to get an idea. So it starts here, whoops and it loops around like that. So, here's the back of a person, here's the front, here's that sling muscle like that. So when the pelvic floor tightens, this sling muscle slings forward and helps to kink off the anal rectal angle, so it helps to keep stool and gas in. For women, it narrows the vagina, and it will, for both genders, press the urethra against the pubic bone. So it helps to press the urethra from behind. So there's a lifting component of the deep layer and a slinging forward component. And then the superficial layer of muscles, we've got the external anal sphincter, external urethral sphincter, and for men muscles to the base of the penis and the testicles. So these superficial muscles work together with the deep, and the deep work together with the superficial, so they work as a team, and you can't separate them. And I don't know if we, we did, what we would do if we could, it would be way too confusing. They all work together. And interestingly, a lot of surgeons um, have stated, Marcy, my uh, mentor and colleague, she spoke, she spoke to some surgeons, and I read in one of the leading researchers in the pelvic floor world, um, and he said in his article, during surgery, you can't separate between the different muscles. Like, it's all, all together. So both as a function and in surgery, they all are the same. But anatomists separate together, but again, can't agree. So those are the, the pelvic floor muscles. What are the pelvic floor roles? So continence, keeping things in that you want to keep in, urine, stool, and gas. They also have a role in uh, contributing towards lumbopelvic stability. So the lumbar spine is the lower back, and then the pelvis itself. And also, of course, have a sexual function. And what's not on here is that um, bladder uh, calming mechanism that I had said before. I should put that on there, called the detrusor reflex inhibition, detrusors, the bladder muscle, and then when you tighten your pelvic floor, it reflexively inhibits, shh, calms the bladder. Okay, so pelvic floor contraction, or what is a Kegel, or Kegel? So does anyone know who, where Kegel or Kegel comes from? It's a dude, it's a guy. It's, <laughs> he was the first to document, gynecologist I should say, to document that we could do these exercises, so they were just named after him. Dr. Arnold Kegel. So, it's really important that you get correct technique, and this is the hardest thing, right? The hardest thing. These muscles you can't see from the outside, like at all. And so, if you're doing, say, um, I don't know, a squat, 
you want to make sure that you're not squatting and getting your knees beyond your toes because you can hurt your knees, right? So people will say, stick your bum out and keep your knees behind your toes. Or if you're doing a yoga pose, um, you know, like they can, you can you could be corrected. But with the pelvic floor muscles, you can't see. So someone from the outside will have no idea. Even me, who's been doing this for over eight years now, I have no idea, no idea what someone's doing until I do an exam. And what they've shown in research, and fortunately they don't have research in this area on men, but they do on women, and they found that based on verbal and written instruction, they check with an internal exam to see if these women are doing these exercises right, over 75% of women aren't doing them right. And I find clinically pretty similar with men. So often verbal and written instruction, which is what most of us get, and I'll do it today, I'll give you verbal instruction how to do it, but I'll still have no idea if you're doing it right. Why is there so much confusion? There's other muscles that are supposed to tighten with the pelvic floor. So the transversus abdominis, or if you've been to a trainer or a, an exercise class, they might call your core, or your TA, or your tranny, there's all these different nicknames for it, or your TBA. So the transversus abdominis is a deep, the deepest layer of the abdominal muscles that are attached to the pelvis in this manner, and I'm going to use my body instead. So the, the medical term for horizontal is transverse. So these muscles, the muscle fibers run horizontally, and they're on either side of the body, and they're connected by a broad sheet of fascia, or connective tissue, and these muscles contract, they cinch in, and they help add stability to the back of the pelvis, and hold in our organs. They are supposed to tighten at the same time as your pelvic floor. But most people are aware of our abdominals, more aware of the abdominals than they are of their pelvic floor. So a lot of people with good intentions start off with the pelvic floor contraction, in come deep abs, which are supposed to come. And then sometimes subconsciously or consciously they feel the abs hang onto that and meanwhile the pelvic floor peters away. So then it just becomes ineffective. So often you kind of switch to one spot. The multifidus, this one doesn't usually get too much in the way, but it's a muscle that's deep in the, in the spine and it's right along either side of spinous process. It also helps to contribute to spinal stability. It's supposed to contract with your pelvic floor, that diaphragm. So the respiratory diaphragm, when we breathe, it contracts and it goes down, which increases the volume in the thoracic cage, which lowers the pressure. And when the pressure within the lungs is lower than the atmospheric pressure, then we breathe in. So the diaphragm helps us, it, it breathes in, and then when we exhale, it's a passive relaxation. When you tighten your pelvic floor, when they do fine wire EMG studies on the diaphragm, there still is the inhalation exhalation cycle on the diaphragm, but there's little changes to it. So it affects the diaphragm. So who, how many people do you think are more aware of our breath than we are of our pelvic floor? A lot of us, right? <laughs> so we sense this change to the diaphragm and try and hold the pelvic floor but end up holding our breath. And then that actually increases intra-abdominal pressure and can push down. And is also not functional because you can't do life holding your breath, unfortunately, right? So you just you end up losing. Um, so these other muscles, when you tighten your pelvic floor, should come in and they should be more of like a side effect, but you don't want to travel away to them. You want to stay localized in the pelvic floor. So that's the team that's supposed to work together. And there's research that supports these muscles are working together. And then there's another team that gets in the way. Glutes. We know our glutes usually, right? Yes. These guys. <laughs> and they're real close. They're real close to our pelvic floor. And when you tighten your pelvic floor, when you tighten this deep layer, the levator ani, it there will be a lift of the perineum. And I've actually made a video of this, so if you check out okay, as you can see it, okay. oh. it um, I am dressed, I'm in yoga pants, and it's but it's right basically a, a video right on my buttocks. And um, I do a pelvic floor contraction, and if you really closely look at the seam, you can see the seam of the pants lift up, but just the seam. And I talk through it, and you see the seam lift up. It's ever, like, ever so subtle, but that's the deep layer of the pelvic floor. And so some people perceive that to be the buttocks, but it's actually the pelvic floor, the deep layer. You want that. And then I show, conversely, a buttock contraction like that. And of course, that's not a pelvic floor contraction. And also, not functional because if you're going for a walk and want to keep dry, you can't walk. You, know, you have to be able to independent, right? Yeah. So you need to be able to isolate that from the glutes. Oh, the inner thighs, the adductors. There, another one that come in to try and squeeze together. And 
What's tricky as well, too, is that with the glutes and the adductors, when you squeeze them, you can get a pelvic floor contraction with it, which is fine. But if you train the pelvic floor and get the person dependent on the glutes and adductors to get it, you can't, again, integrate it into day-to-day -day life. So you want to be able to do the pelvic floor independent of everything else. So basically, from the outside, if you're doing it right, you know what you know what you're doing. Okay. And then the abdominals. So there's the deepest layer of abdominals, but then there's other ones too. So there's the transversus, then there's the internal oblique, which muscle fibers run that way, and then there's the external oblique, and muscle fibers run that way, and then the rectus abdominis, the two six-pack muscles. So sometimes you try and make that abdominal contraction that's supposed to come with the pelvic floor, people try and make it stronger, and then they grab obliques, and then guess what happens? Down. So it's really tricky to get it right. So there are different ways that you can cue a pelvic floor contraction. So most often people think, well, I'm leaking urine, so why not think of tightening as if you're stopping the flow of pee? That can work. But for most people, they actually get a, a submaximal contraction, or it's, it's just a small percentage of the person's actual potential. So for most people, not all, but I would say like 95% of people, cueing the pelvic floor contraction from the anus gets a much superior contraction. And I say, I'm not forgetting that, I'm, that the incontinence is urinary, but that whatever you do at the back also happens at the front. And there is some research too, I haven't checked in a while, but there's two studies on men and two studies on women that compared the cues, tightness if you're holding pee, or lifting the testicles, or some penis cue, or for women tightening from the vagina, compared that to tightening from the anus, and combinations. And they found that more of the entire pelvic floor was involved when the person was tightening from the anus. So, does that make sense so far? They all work together. Now, some people say, well, Laura, when I tighten my anus, I can't really feel the front coming. And I say, yes, that can be the case because the, we have more nerve endings and sensation at the anus, which makes it a better muscle to think of tightening from because you can find it better and feel it and see if you're holding it correctly. But it also means that your sensory information will be more dominant at the anus because that's where we can feel it the most. So you can tighten from the anus and then see if you can think of tightening the front. And, and for me, when I tighten from the anus and I try and think about it in the front, I can't because it's already in kind of thing. So that's one way I talk about. Uh, for women, if I'm doing a vaginal exam, I will be assessing along the front vaginal wall and I'll say tighten from the anus and they'll say, I know your vagina is tightening because I'm right there. I can feel it. And then another way to show people, which I think is the best way, is with real-time ultrasound imaging, where we image the same technology they do when they're looking for um, any imaging of your soft tissue or for women for, for pregnancy, but we image right above the pubic bone. And on the screen, you can see the bladder and you can see the pelvic floor. And often it looks like this. I say tighten as if you're holding pee and you'll see lift. And then I say, okay, tighten as if you're tightening from the anus and you see this a ton more. So then I say, you can see how even though you're thinking from the back, you are lifting the front, you need more of the front because that's what's supporting that front wall. So for most people, tighten the anus is the best cue. And everyone's a little bit different. So there are some physical things that you could look for with a hand mirror or... Do you have a question? Do you have a question? No? <laughs> um, when you do a contraction properly, the testicles should draw in a little bit. I would want viewers to see what she has. Uh, <laughs> the penis will draw in a little bit. Uh, right between the anus and the base of the penis and the testicles, right at the perineum, that area between, you can feel with your finger and for men, when you tighten, it'll feel like there's a rope bulking up. It's not the same for women. For women, we want to feel a lift. You want to make sure that it's not abdominal lead. Well, here's something else that's important too. So when you tighten your pelvic floor, the deep abdominals should co-contract. So they're two different muscles. But when you lead the contraction from the abdominals, the pelvic floor contraction is only supposed to be a little bit. So if you think of pulling your belly in, pulling in the core, and hoping to get a closure at the pelvic floor, you'll get some, but not the full potential compared to when you think of pulling it in from the, from the pelvic floor, usually from the anus. Does that make sense? So um, you, want, you don't want the pelvic floor contractions to be abdominal-led. You want to go right to the anus. That's the usual cue. You want to make sure it's not about a contraction. And again, you got to make sure you're breathing. Very important. So pelvic floor rehab is actually more of a skill. It's not so much of a force thing or, or um, 
it's not like you can muscle through it, like which is sometimes really hard. And the people that I find uh, have the most difficulty with this are usually athletes, and often men, because we're used to doing it like like doing real things, and then you end up grabbing all the wrong muscles. And it's interesting, and I'll show you. Um, I use EMG biofeedback, which is the same technology as a heart rate monitor, but instead of the little electrodes going around your heart and picking up your heartbeat. It goes to your pelvic floor. There's three stickies. One goes to the inner thigh, and the other two I get it pretty much as close as I can right into the anus there, outside the anus. And when you contract your pelvic floor, and I have a picture, the, the line will go up, and when you let it go, it'll come down. And if you're holding the pelvic floor contraction, it'll stay up. But if you're not holding it, it'll fall down. <laughs> so a lot of people, when they try and make this strong, uh. you end up seeing just a little itty bitty pelvic floor contraction because there's all these other muscles doing the work. But if you can keep everything else relaxed from the outside and focus right on that right spot, you see a real powerful contraction. So it's, it's um, sometimes a shifting of reference or perception of what you expect it to feel like. Because it can feel a little different than what people expect to feel. So it's more about control, it's more about skills. So like learning to play a piano, it's a skill. You can't mash away on it, right? You have to learn how to, how to play the, the right keys at the right time. So rehabilitation, what does this look like? We want to first assess to make sure, can the person isolate that muscle? Can they contract that muscle and keep everything else out of it except for a little bit of low belly? That's okay for it to come in. C is contract. Can they contract? Can they hold? And can they relax? And all three are different. Some people can contract but can't hold. Some people contract and they don't relax well. It's staggered down. Um, so there's, it's variation all over the place. You do want to absolutely build strength because some of those pressures that come down, like sneezing and coughing and lifting and carrying, or if you do what um, my, my middle guy does, he likes to do run jumps, or run hugs, sorry. So he'll, he'll run and then jump in the air. He's not little. And so um, I see him coming like this, and I, it's going to be, have to be a strong pelvic floor contraction because he's strong. So I see him running and I go, hey, just get in here and I hang on and pull it in and I hang on and grab him. <laughs> so you need to have strength to be able to meet the demands of whatever the activity is or whether you're jumping or whether you're lifting a briefcase or grandkids and things. And endurance is important too because if you've got one sneeze, that's great, but you want to stay dry for the whole rest of the sneezes or for the whole entire walk. Standing's really important because standing builds strength the fastest. So most people aren't aware that pelvic floor exercises should be do it done in standing, and that's because it has to lift against gravity, which is more resistance, so it gets stronger and faster. It's also functional. When Eric runs at me, I'm standing, so I better know how to fire and pull that in. When I sneeze, I might be, I might be standing and, and all of that. So you need to be able to do it in standing. And most of you guys, and possibly women, might identify that symptoms if it's, if it's bladder or bowel control or organ support issues. They are worse than standing because of gravity. So we want to get those muscles strong in that position you need. And then get the muscle to come in when it's supposed to. So they have shown, with stress incontinence, when there's pressure down in the bladder and there's leakage, sometimes it's happening because the muscles aren't strong enough. Sometimes it's because the muscle doesn't have endurance. But they've also shown that the timing can be off. So before surgery or before kids, if you're a woman, or before the incontinence started to occur, you could sneeze or cough and jump and lift and bend and carry, you wouldn't leak. And that's because as the pressure came down, the pelvic floor automatically tightened. And they've shown that sometimes that timing can be lost. So even if your muscles are super duper strong, if you sneeze and that muscle doesn't come in, well, so what, you'll still leak. So we've got to make sure the muscle comes in, or another way to say it, having doesn't mean anything unless you know how to use it. The other thing that's important for radical prostatectomy is a lot of that internal sphincter that is not under our volitional control. It would be coming in automatically. A lot of that's been taken out, so we need to rely more on the external sphincter, which will take more thought and processing of pulling it in when you're doing tasks and activities. The good news is that they've shown that when you tighten your pelvic floor before you sneeze every time or cough or lift, it starts to become more automatic. We're not sure why or how. It could be that some, there's some neuroplasticity that the brain starts to rewire and begin makes more automatic, or probably that you get, become more habitual. You know when you cough, we used to cough into our hands, but now we do a, a cough pocket, what they call it in preschool, a cough pocket. You don't even think about it anymore, right? You just do it. So every time I see him running, anus comes in without me thinking about it. Here comes the sneeze, I'm pulling it in automatically without having to think about it too much. So it becomes habitual. 
what you do want to make sure though before you do these exercises is we'll see what your urologist says. Um, some recommend waiting for catheter removal before starting or returning to pelvic floor exercises. Every urologist is different. What I do want to say, and I should have said at the beginning, if you have any questions, please let's fly by the seat of our pants and throw your hand up and we'll go. Yes. Um, I do have one question in regards to um, nerve stimulation. If um, yes. you have an impairment in uh, any nerve stimulation in the pelvic floor area, uh, how successful are you going to be with mm. this muscle contraction? And do you mean um, like uh, neuromuscular stimulation or do you mean transcutaneous stim? No, neuromuscular. Neuromuscular. Yeah. Um, I personally have never used it in my practice. Um, I don't find that it's necessary. And often, you know, it's funny, I should be up on the research a bit more. So the idea, let's say you have in physiotherapy, say you have a wrist injury, and you're working on getting your wrist to be able to extend back against gravity like this, which is important for things like opening doors or jars because there's always some wrist extension to get the most strength out of your grip. But if there's an injury and this muscle is weak, with volitional control, the person may only be able to get this far up. So with um, neuromuscular uh, stim or muscle stim, they can put those little sensors on and send electricity to the muscles and help that muscle get even a bit more out of it, right? So that, that makes sense in, the, in those settings. So with the pelvic floor, there is such a thing where you can put a probe in the anus or if it's a woman in the vagina as well to help stimulate those muscles. I've never used it. The only time I, I would use it theoretically is if a person is completely lost in their body and can't find those muscles on their own and they can't figure out how to tighten it, then that stimulation might help them figure out how to find and contract it. They have shown that in the pelvic floor, when you stimulate with the, uh, the probe, the muscle doesn't contract in the same order with slow and twa fast twitch muscles as it does in a volitional control. So it doesn't follow the same patterning. Um, I've not had it done myself, but Marcy, we've discussed and we've had a couple of physios in our clinic do the stim, and she said the contraction that you get from the stim is very different feeling from what the contraction that she gets volitionally. Um, I actually had a anesthesiologist in Vancouver that I was treating, post-radical prostatectomy, very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, motivated individual and he got great results from his pelvic floor exercises but didn't get completely dry and he was like is there anything else I can do and so I said well we could try this stim and he bought his unit and he had the rectal probe and he followed this protocol that was in a research study that I found and I saw him after doing the the full therapy and he said he didn't really notice any improvement from what he got from the volitional control so we got the group with volitional control and adding the stim didn't really add much to it um, so that's my attempt at an answer um, so if people are lost, if people can't find their pelvic floor, what I tend to go to is actually a rectal exam. It's super helpful and can really get a person coordinated and finding that spot in their body. So I had, uh, for example, a woman who uh, was actually in Vancouver. She was a doula. She had, was a childbirth educator, and she was coming for pelvic floor exercises. And, and as she was um, explaining to me, that she, she says, you know what, I, I think I'm doing it right because when I'm having sex with my husband, I say, can you feel this? And I thought, well, okay, she must know what she's doing. So then we get, we get to the exam and I'm doing a vaginal exam and I say, okay, show me what you do for a Kegel. And she squeezed every single other muscle in her body, everything else except for her pelvic floor. So I didn't say to her, your husband's not telling the truth. I said, I said, I said, no, that's not quite it. And so we tried a bunch of different cues and it didn't really work. And so then what I did is I said, with her permission and consent, I said, okay, we're gonna do a small rectal exam. So I just do it to the first knuckle. So you basically insert the finger. And what you should feel if the nerves are intact is a reflex of contraction as you slide the finger in. Then as you stay still, that reflex will let go. And then what you do, and I say to people, okay, can you feel my finger? And they're usually like, yeah. And then I say, okay, can you, can you pinch it? And most of the time they're like, poof. And, she, and so I did that for her, she was like, that? That's a Kegel? I was like, yeah. So anyways, um, and so when people get it like that, then we see if we can get it hands free. But initially some people really need that feedback. So then I send them home, and as an exercise, sitting on the floor in a slouch position, putting their finger in their anus a little bit, keeping everything really relaxed and still, closing their eyes, finding that muscle, and giving it a pinch, and learning how to isolate that way. So I tend to find that to be a heck of a lot more um, uh, helpful. Mind you, I've never tried the stim.
No, no. What is a stim? I oh, it was short for stimulus, but it is. Yes, um, stims the muscle, Stimul stimulates the muscle. Yeah, it just sends electrical impulses. <laughs> like Dr. Holmes kind of thing. It's basically, yeah, I'm right, I know. No thanks, right? I know. <laughs> um, great question, though. Yeah. Um, any other questions so far? Yes. It's been uh, six months since I had this external yeah. beam radiation. Yes. And uh, I still have. Uh, leaks yeah. and, um, and and a burning sensation. Mm -hmm. The oncologist says it's urinary tract infection, okay. but the um, urologist says it's damage caused by the external beam radiation. Right. To the sensory nerves, possibly, I guess, right? Um, and they, they would rule out with a, a testing for bacteria. And I guess, it's, does it come back negative? Um, no. Yeah. Uh, he said, all he said to me was, it's surprising. So I got six uh, prescriptions for antibiotics. Yeah. It didn't really help. It didn't really help. No. And when they sent you your urine for a culture, did they come back growing bacteria? He, yes, he said it, it was uh, not the bacteria that he expected. He said oh. it was a mixture of right. flora or whatever. So then hence the six different antibiotics, yeah. yeah. But the urologist says I should go for laser surgery. Oh, OK. Whatever that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Are you aware, Connie, of what that would look like, the laser surgery? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the leakage that you have, when you leak, is it from sneezing, coughing, bending over, or is it you get a sudden urge and you can't go and get to the toilet in time? Well, it happens just before I'm about to dock my vote. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, so urgency-related urinary incontinence, exactly. So, yeah, so physio might be able to help as well, too. Um, to help, uh, <laughs> um, uh, help you to teach you how to use your pelvic floor muscles to calm your bladder down so that you can keep control until you get to the toilet exactly. Yeah, and to calm things down. And we would go through the dietary information and I get you to fill out a bladder diary looking at fluid in, types of fluid in, fluid out, how often you go pee, get you to measure when you pee, how much you go pee, all of that sort of stuff. And then we I did some measurements and mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it's really confusing. Mm -hmm. um, I go to bed at nine o'clock yeah. and uh, get up usually probably once every hour. Yeah. But during the night, sometimes I'll avoid mm -hmm. about two liters. Yeah. In question, total or at once? In total. Okay, good. So I'm wondering where the hell it comes from. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, do you have any uh, swelling or edema in your feet or any, um, no? Because sometimes, you know, of course, going lying on your back, the swelling can come back and then you clear it. Um, from my understanding as well, too, after age 60, 65, there's a hormone that the kidney produces or that affects the kidneys that actually makes you make more urine at night. So that's, the, they say that nocturia, waking up to go pee, is normal after age 60, 65 to be twice a night. Now that being said, I'd be looking more at the volumes. And what we're looking for is every pee should be at least a cup or more. And so if you're going four times a night, it's about two liters, it sounds like it is a cup. So it's appropriate, your bladder's signaling you appropriately. Can you get to the toilet in time? Uh, and uh, what, what I do is I, uh, <clears throat> I, I use the toilet so often yeah. that the toilet failed and I had to buy a new toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the silver lining is that my new toilet only uses 1.6 liters. <laughs> <of this. laughs> yeah. For the environment, fantastic. <laughs> okay, awesome. Does that answer your question somewhat? Yeah. Okay. But am I doomed for... Uh, Are you doomed? For this leak <coughs> to carry on year after year? I would, I would um, follow up to make sure, they call it, I'm pretty sure, a test of cure. So make sure after you take the antibiotics, get them to run the culture again, make sure it's clear. Mm -hmm. And I would see physio. Yeah. Yeah. Get that bladder back under your control. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions so far? Yeah. What would be a typical daily cycle of pelvic uh, floor exercise? Yes. Yes, that's perfect. So we'll get to that. That's a great question, though. Absolutely. Yeah, what does that look like in sets and reps and that kind of thing, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like how long you hold? Because it is a muscle that gets tired. That's right. It sure does. It sure does. Exactly. Okay. So, um, supine means lying down, so it's usually easier to find your pelvic floor in a lying position because everything else is relaxed. Not always true, but more often than not, lying down is easier to figure it out. Then you want to get up and standing though, because that's a functional position and that's against gravity to build more strength. 
and then making sure those muscles are tightening when you're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be. So when you lift weights or sneeze or cough or get up out of a chair, etc. So you want to integrate all different levels. So the research shows that during pelvic floor muscle exercises, it quickens the return to continence after radical prostatectomy. And some pretty good systematic reviews. And preoperative, so before surgery, pelvic floor muscle exercises improve continence and quality of life outcomes after radical prostatectomy. Early biofeedback not only quickens recovery of incontinence, um, it lowers the severity of avoiding symptoms, so how often, um, and pelvic floor, for, uh, pelvic floor muscle strength is 12 months post-op. So it's great, we've got research supporting, yes? What sort of biofeedback signs do you have? Are there? Uh, biofeedback signs? Signs. Like signs. What's, what, in what form? Yeah. So what I use is electrical, um, electromyogenic biofeedback, or EMG. So looking at the pelvic floor muscles, so these are where the electrodes are right near the anus, and so in the office when you contract, it goes up and down. This is um, going in gradual and then letting go, and then someone holding, but you can see how it sort of faded away at the end. So essentially biofeedback is just any feedback that gives you, anything that gives you feedback on what your body is doing. So mirror is biofeedback, or putting your finger on the perineum is biofeedback, or real-time ultrasound watching that collateral lift is biofeedback, or EMG biofeedback. Um, so this is really great because you get a visual of what you're doing and it helps to correlate to what you're doing inside your body. Um, and in comparison, here's a better 10 second hold and you can see at the end uh, there was a clear drop. And so I really look to see the quality of the contractions and it's really helpful for me to use the biofeedback too because what I feel at my finger at the perineum or if I'm doing a rectal exam gives me information but when I combine what I feel with what I see it's much more specific. And then once we've got an idea with the client and I that we're getting it right, then we go hands-free and nothing's now in the rectum or women in the vagina or at the perineum. And now they can still get a sense of what's going on because when you're at home, you're not going to have someone having their finger or hand there, right, kind of thing. Or when you're in the grocery store and here comes a sneeze, you're not going to reach down, right? So you need to be able to find that muscle and you still get that idea there. Now, I'm not sure why. Um, my, myself and there's two other pelvic floor physios that work at the clinic I work at, we use biofeedback, and I'm not sure why, but the other pelvic floor physios um, are on the island, because there are some other ones as well too, they don't use biofeedback, I think they're nuts. This is super helpful, super, super helpful. I think they should use it. Yeah, it, right, it, exactly, and it's, people are just blown away. Sometimes it helps to look while you're doing it. Sometimes people get too competitive and they want to get it high and they start to squeeze their own muscles. So sometimes it helps to not look, feel, and then look after. And if it helps them to look while they're doing it, I eventually want them to wean away and not look kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so does that answer your question about the biofeedback, different types? Okay, so sets and reps, which I actually don't have on a slide, so we'll do it now. So I first want to make sure a person can isolate in and out. And then I see, can they hold? Let's just try it. So I say, okay, tighten your pelvic floor, usually from the anus, if that's how we've determined the best contraction is. Tighten your pelvic floor, keep it in, and see if you can hold it and breathe at the same time. Most people can't. Most people, they tighten, and they're trying to hold, and there it goes. <laughs> and sometimes they see it on the screen, they're like, come on, and it's just falling. So most times people can't hold. So then what I do is I try a different exercise, this one here called a ramp, where I get them to pull in their pelvic floor gradually, so tighten the anus gradually, until they're at the top, and at the top letting it go quickly. So this exercise often helps to keep a person isolated because you're going slow and paying attention to what's coming in and making sure the glutes that don't come in, legs and abs. And then when they get to the top, they let go and so they can get a sense of a proper release of the right muscle. Because if you do a pelvic floor contraction and you squeeze your glutes and you let go, you'll feel your glutes let go. So that tells you, oh no, glutes are in there. But if you do a contraction and you let go and you only feel the anus let go, great. You pulled in the anus and you only let go of the anus and that's what we're aiming for. Because you're going slow, you are holding a contraction, right? So this person's in a contraction for about four or five seconds. So it is a version of a hold. So it's something to build awareness, gain, keeping that person isolated in that muscle, gradually pulling it in, and then feeling that proper release. So another example of a person trying to hold, but not actually holding. And so when they let go, they might say, sometimes people say, I'm stuck, I can't let go. But it's not that they're, because they don't, they don't feel anything let go. It's because they already like go way back there. 
right? So that's usually the case. Most people have lost it like within a few seconds. So when you've actually done a nice solid 10 second hold, you should feel that nice big clear release from the anus. So it's more about um, clarity of sensation at the anus or the perineum or testicles, whatever your cue is, rather than typical strength and feeling kind of thing. So it's really, and what I like about this is it's very mindful, it's very meditative, it's a very clearly mind-body connection. And when you get it right and you're skillful in it, there's an element of ease to it. Like if, like right now I'm talking about doing a pelvic floor contraction, and you should be able to talk at the same time and then I let it go, but you guys didn't see anything because it's all just from the inside kind of thing. So it's a, an element of ease and then that's helpful because when you integrate it into tasks, exercising, tasks of daily living, you want to be able to do other things at the same time as you're doing it. So it's really tricky, but it can be really powerful when you get it right. And so often these one-on-one -on -one sessions are imperative to be able to get that person right in that right spot. But once they've got it, once they know they can do it, then they can take that skill and their own body knowledge and awareness up to whatever, whether it's an exercise class or to golfing or to sailing or whatever the case is. I tried to teach, and even knowing, even knowing what I knew, I thought, and the clinic owner said, Laura, why don't we get you to teach a yoga class? And we'll integrate pelvic floor into it. And I was really excited because I love yoga and I love doing this work. And so I tried it and I taught yoga class to four, four women in this class. Two I had done exams on before, two I hadn't seen before. And I'm talking, doing this yoga class and saying all the right words, like tighten your anus, make sure you're breathing, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I was up there, I was like, this is useless. I have no idea if they're doing it right. So I'm so used to being able to tell in the moment, was that right? Could you tell it was right? No, it wasn't right. Why wasn't it right? Could you tell the legs came in and all of that? So it's even me teaching a class, I would have no idea. So I need to teach that person that they know so that they can take it out to day-to-day -day stuff and exercise. So when you can't actually hold a 10 second contraction and are actually holding it, the goal is in standing to do a 10 second hold, a 10 second rest, 30 of them in a row, once a day, yeah, yeah, you get real strong. But can people do that right off the bat? Usually no. So usually we just work on the spikes and then the ramps, so it's more about getting that, but that's the goal. So it's like three sets of 10, all in a row, in stand, while you're breathing. Any questions about the exercises so far? Yes? If you're not really having any incontinence yeah. problems, should you still be doing the kegels? It's a good question. Maybe not as urgent. Um, for as we age, if we don't use muscles, they do get weaker over time. So as a preventative measure, I would say yes. Um, yeah. So preventative measure, I say I would say yeah. Yeah. More so, especially for women as well too, because of if they've had prior childbirth and. Um, and the estrogen changes and all of that, that really can expedite pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. But yeah, absolutely, I think that's a great idea. It also helps with bowel control as well, and the number one reason for admission, number two reason for admission in long-term care facilities is incontinence behind, you know, dementia. So it's, it's, yeah, sometimes it's hard when you don't know what it's like to not have that skill, you take it for granted. Yeah. I remember in, um, in school, it was a spinal cord injury component, and they had, uh, it was really great, they had some spinal cord injury survivors come in and talk to the class, and we were talking about rehab and what they wanted back most, and they said, initially, I wanted to be able to walk and be able to run and do my tasks, but then as, they, as the years went on, they were like, you know what, I just love to have my bowel and bladder control back. So I would say preventatively, yeah, it's probably not a bad idea. The other cool thing is that when you've got good pelvic floor control, you're going to be connected to your deep, uh, deep, sometimes called the inner unit, your pelvic floor, your deep abs. That's going to help keep you strong in other areas of your life, like at the gym, when you're gardening, when you're whatever. So yeah, for optimal function, I'd say yeah. 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 Question? Are we done yet? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yes, any other questions? Do you recommend any apps? Yeah, great question. There are some apps out there, and there's some devices, um, some biofeedback units for women as well, too, where, um, so the, the apps, again, will just, it'll give you verbal instruction. Like, they'll say, tighten for this long, let go for this long, but who knows if you're doing it right? Like, if you, when you know if you're doing it right, then yes, you could use those apps. What I recommend to people, 
is once they can do 10 second holds, I just get them to download any app, and you can even use your iPhone timer, and just every 10 seconds contract, and then rest for 10 seconds, and then tighten for 10 seconds. So there's no real, unfortunately, there's no real one that just gets it. It's kind of the old school, you gotta go down, make sure you're doing those exercises right. There's no real magic app that'll do it. Or, or stimming it. There's, there's, there's units for, um, for women. There's the, the best one out there is called LV, and this uh, unit goes in the vagina. And it's got, um, when you squeeze the pelvic floor on your phone, there's a little jewel that goes up. And it's funny, I use it, and, um, and I'm, I'm like, okay, get this jewel up, and I can, I'm tightening it. I know I'm not supposed to be tightening other things, but I'm trying to get this damn jewel up, and I'm like, here comes my glutes and my legs, and I'm trying to get, and I'm like, God. So it really can get you into the competitive, and you really lose your skills. So it's really, it's a nice idea, but for this line of work, you got to get down to the nitty gritty, do the hard work kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, good question, though. You guys might have been addressed or uh, um, explained clamps before. Um, yes, I know. Are you okay? Oh, okay. I'll be done in just a couple of minutes. Oh, uh, oh here. So there's uh, different types of clamps, which is essentially just a closure mechanism right on the penis. Uh, the Cunningham clamp is one that's been out for a long time. It does have metal in it though, so if you go through a metal detector in the airport, it will come <laughs> <laughs> um, And for the, <laughs> for the Cunningham clamp, um, it's you can only wear it for a few hours at a time, I think. Uh, there's a maximum wear time, and then you have to take it off for a few hours to let blood flow to come back. Whereas the J clamp, the Jackson clamp, there's a notch in it that allows for blood flow and you can just loosen the, when you go to the toilet or the urinal, you loosen it just enough to allow the urine out and then you can um, tighten it back up and can wear it a bit longer. But these sorts of devices and the Acti Cup too, this is a um, disposable. So you use this just um, uh, one use and it's an absorbable pouch and you just put it at the tip of the penis and then, and then um, close it off. So those are nice ways sometimes to get back into activities like swimming. Um, and things like that where you, it's difficult to wear a brief or a pad kind of thing. Um, so those are those different assistive devices. Okay, and to the end here, erectile dysfunction. So, there are muscles in the pelvic floor for men that help to maintain the blood flow in the penis, constrict the blood flow to maintain the erection, including the bulbospongiosis, bul or sometimes called bulbum cavernosis. Again, there's different names. And the issue of cavernosis muscle. So you know when you do uh, bicep curls, doing them over and over again, you can build up the bulk and the thickness and the, uh, the thickness of those muscles and the biceps. Do the same with pelvic floor. You can build up the bulk and thicken up those muscles. So the contractions of the issue of cavernosis and bulbum cavernosis, it basically just increases pressure. And if that muscle is more bulky because of you doing exercises, it'll help maintain better, keep that blood flow in the erection. So it's it's one way that can help. If there's nerve injury, um, there's it's not going to be the be all end all, but there is sometimes it can help with these, doing these exercises with with uh, maintaining or getting an erection. Um, that makes sense so far. I think that might be it. There we go. So thank you and. It's never, it's never going. My job is never going. <laughs> so thanks again for coming out. And I think Connie has a little presentation here. Thank you. Oh, I really want to.